Hello and welcome to the podcast. This welcome. Is, this is a new everybody. podcast. It, it might have been like demon possessed. It was a fairly large, mutated looking chicken. We were born in the north, but we grew up in the south. We learned all of our words from Pennsylvania. And people are like, that toboggan. That little toboggan. It's not there. a toboggan. <laughs> toboggan is a sled. Okay. Yo, point three is just baby. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I can't take it. Welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. Um, I know it looks a little weird. Um, we are separate. Um, I'm at least on this episode. Last week I <laughs> yeah, wasn't on. That's true. Um, but we are still kind of keeping ourselves a little distant because I'm still waiting back to hear if I'm completely COVID free. But I'm feeling a lot better. And you're, um, yeah, you're feeling you're feeling good. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling a million bucks, ready to go conquer the world. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Did, ready um, for Christmas, too. Has anything interesting happened recently? Have you been watching anything while you've been uh, sick or in quarantine that you'd like to talk about at all? I don't know if it's a recommendation that I would be like, this is the best show ever. Okay. But I watched a little bit of Good Doctor. It was new because <laughs> I've never watched any, like, I never was into... Uh, the like what what show did you guys watch for a while that not uh not like er but the that other one that's like er it's the, like gray's anatomy but i was anatomy i, I never on. watched it i'm not into that show um i mean i i wouldn't say it was that good i watched a couple episodes and i'm like yeah it's, it's okay it's not my cup of tea though what gray's anatomy or good doctor no good doctor okay so it's not really your kind of show, but you watched a little bit of it. Yep. Gotcha. I've uh I've been watching a really good show, Peaky Blinders. Mm-hmm. Have okay. you ever heard of it? <laughs> it's on it's it on sounds Netflix. Familiar, but yeah, I've it's not on Netflix. Watched it. I think you told me to watch it, maybe. Yeah, um, it's it's pretty I know good. You were watching uh Queen's Gambit. Yep, we and finished that's really that show right now. Yep, that's actually Queen's Gambit was really good. I was hearing those statistics, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and as soon as you watched it, you were like, let's play chess, and I heard some statistics about, like, chess, oh, like, people buying chess games from stores yes. and from the internet have, like, skyrocketed yes. because of this show. And I don't know why. I didn't watch the show, so I don't get the hype. But it's because if you never, if you've played chess and you know the rules, that show is all about playing chess. Yeah. And um, it just gets you psyched up. It just is like, I do love this game, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And it's exciting because chess is so it's so in depth and it allows you to use your brain so much in a new way that's strategy and that is um confrontational but also slow moving and it's all it's all a mind game but on a board with another person and it's a beautiful thing that you can oppose someone in a very calm thoughtful way like that and that show really brings out if you know how to play the game if you've played it before and you've enjoyed it then that show really brings out this desire to want to just dive into it and just become a big chess player I mean it's it made me just want to go out into the (laughs) cold and just wear a jacket and a hat and play chess with old men for hours it kind of makes you think though um that like netflix has so much power over things because they released a show is that a netflix original i believe so yeah um netflix really released a show about chess and they controlled the market value Mm -hmm. for chess for the game of chess yeah. People buying chess sets and just playing the like app. There's apps out there for chess and stuff like yes. that. People are playing them because of this game and how much influence one TV show or Netflix has because they released that mm-hmm. TV show. Yes. It, it, I saw, I got an email from a chess app I downloaded that mm-hmm. I could play a computer and it was giving me. Uh, it was giving me options of like, would you like to play like a digital version of Beth, who's the main character in that show? Mm. And I guess it just means it's like a really 
super difficult level of chess to be able to play her. But it was like advertising, you want to play this character, you know, on like yeah. a computer version of chess on this app. And it was pretty cool. I think it's just, uh, I don't know, it was just a good, slower moving, mild drama about the yeah. game of chess and about cool characters. And so it was uh, highly recommend. But also, I highly recommend Peaky Blinders. You have never watched Peaky Blinders at all, right? I have not. I actually, uh, Tim, we've talked about him a good bit. He's one of our good friends. I started the show, and mm. I instantly was like, Tim would love this show. He would absolutely love it. And then Kenzie was like, yeah, this seems like a show that he would watch. And I texted him and said, have you heard of Peaky Blinders? He said, yes, it's my absolutely favorite show on Netflix. And I said, oh, I'm really? watching it, yeah. And I said, I'm watching it right now. I thought you'd like it. And he's like, that's funny that you thought of me. But the I reason I- then, Peaky Blinders? Yeah, it's what is really it about? good. So um, it's essentially Just give about- a quick 30 second synopsis. Okay, so there's these Irish uh, individuals in, I don't know what years necessarily. I never pay good attention to the years whenever they tell me in the show. But they're like, you know, the page boy. They're wearing the, the hats. You know, Newsies era, but over in- um, over in Belfast, I believe is the mm -hmm. the area that, that it's based out of. And they're pretty much kind of like this gambling crime family that's rising in power. And that's the, that's, the, that's the idea of the show. The reason I thought of Tim is not only because of the aspect of them trying to gain authority and um, wealth and respect through this avenue of kind of a crime family, but also their little, you know, newsy hats that they wear. Mm -hmm. They keep razor blades right on the brim in the hats. And whenever mm -hmm. they get annoyed or they have to start a fight or something, they rip the hats off and they start slashing the eyes of people that with their hats and they Gosh. get like bloody faces and stuff. It's really hardcore, but it was like so, I don't know. It was just, it just was an awesome vibe and it reminded me of Tim. And I was like, he's got to love this. I'm really enjoying yeah. it on top of a good, action you know thinking crime film or show it's also a good drama so if you like godfather yeah. it, it's right up your alley yeah um so have you been working on any projects projects outside of the podcast you want to share with everybody yeah yeah i'm actually uh i just finished up a wedding that we talked about that we did oh yeah um, a few weeks ago and it was really good i actually I, I, we, they, they, I sent it to them. They put it online on Facebook for people to watch. And somebody that I've done a wedding video before commented and thought it was really good. And they were, you know, kind of bragging that I was able to do theirs in the past as well, Malia. And, ah. um, and it turned out really nicely. I think people thought it was beautiful and they really enjoyed it. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, it was a good time, but I just finished it up. I don't, I should have counted up how many weddings I've done at this point because it's been kind of like a back and forth number because I don't really know exactly. But it's, I believe it's somewhere you kinda, around. You kind of uh, just lose count after a while. <laughs> yeah, but I haven't done that many. I mean, it's only been like 11 or 12 or something like that. But mm -hmm. but yeah, it's uh, it's it was good. It was fun. I enjoyed it. The venue is beautiful, but I think we've already talked about this. Yeah, um, we, but we I talked about it. it on a couple episodes. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I haven't done a lot because I've been in quarantine. Um, I will say, and I guess you can tell me if I can talk about the photos that, can I show one of the photos that yeah. I took of yeah, you go ahead. and Kenzie? Um, so a couple of weeks ago before we went into quarantine, before I went into quarantine, um, we I took some photos of Joseph and Mackenzie because their anniversary is coming up. Um, mm -hmm. And we can throw one or two up on the screen just right quick so you can see. Um, I had a little bit of fun time. I was just been editing those during this quarantine. Um, we took those and, pictures right before, right before know, you was, got sick. <laughs> yeah, and I've been editing them. That's all I've been doing during this quarantine, just editing yeah. photos. I mean, it's not like it took me that long. Just that's all I did because I was sick. But um, so that's what I have done so far in the past week or two, um, and then a lot of sleeping. <laughs> I know last week we gave you a call on the podcast and you did the midnight special, but um, yeah. But do you uh, do you think that the the COVID was as bad as as you 
thought it would be? I I thought it was exactly it actually it may be it was weird because I didn't think I would get it. I kind of had in the back of my mind I'm like I'm not getting covid. <laughs> it's been since March. Um I just don't think I'm going to get covid yeah. anymore. Um I was still taking precautions. I mean, at work I was wearing a mask and things like that, but um I just didn't think I would get it. And yeah. then when I got it, um, I'm like, man, I almost, I didn't want to accept that I had it at first. And mm-hmm. cause I started showing symptoms like Tuesday and then I waited that whole like Tuesday and uh, like that night I started having a really bad fever. And then two Wednesday morning at like five or six o'clock, I got up and I'm like, I can't go into work. Mm-hmm. And then I called you because you were up going into work. And I'm like, dude, I think I have COVID. I don't want to accept this, but I think I have COVID. <laughs> yeah. What was your thought when I told when I called you, when I was like calling you that early in the morning? What did you think? I will say this. So you found out you were potentially exposed. And mm-hmm. I I thought at first, I was like, I think, I think everything's okay. Um mm-hmm. So did I. I didn't think we I were we were planning on the next, you know, that week. You got you got exposed Friday and it was like Sunday when we realized that guy was sick that you were around. Mm-hmm. And well, I don't know for sure it was that person. I well, got the, the COVID likelihood from, that it was is kind of high yeah. probably. Um and then uh and then we were planning on going to see family on Thursday and besides mm-hmm. work, we were well, at least me and Kenzie were, we were staying pretty isolated. Like we weren't trying to be around anybody except yeah. for who were normally around, which is like one and friend I just and you. botched it up for everybody. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, it was work that botched it up because, um, you know, you, you work at Lowe's, so you're around people. And although you can, tr- and you, you kept your mask on, like it's against the rules, you can get in trouble if you don't wear a mask at work. Yeah. But you still got it. And, um, and so was your Sunday, we were, I was wondering, well, Sunday I was wondering, should yeah. we go? Like, should we go back to our families, you know, not knowing if we were actually, you know, exposed or not? And yeah. then um, and then I think it was Tuesday, I believe. Yeah. No, it, it was, was Wednesday morning when No, I, it was Tuesday when I called you or you okay. called me and said the guy tested positive. Yeah, and, it was, and then I, I on my break on Tuesday. I yeah, figured it out. And I asked you, "Are you feeling any symptoms?" And this is when I kind of, I kind of knew in my gut that you had caught it. <laughs> I didn't know to what extent it would be, but it was. Yeah, you said, "I have this like little scratchy thing in my throat, but I've had that before. It's fine. Like it's just, <laughs> it's just the weather." Well, when see, I, when you thing, said that, my too. it was like it was like my gut knew. I was like, "Oh man, he's <laughs> definitely got it." That that's the thing too. When he met, he messaged me um, on Facebook and said, "Hey, I had I tested positive for the COVID," and I in the back of my head, I'm like, "That's not good." But I didn't want to be like, "Oh, I have COVID," and leave work because I didn't want to be like, "Oh, he just got positive." I don't want to say that. Oh, he might have given it to me when I have no symptoms at mm-hmm. all, and. So I kind of had that in the back of my head too until I got home from work and I'm like, I got a fever when I got home from work. <laughs> yeah. I, and then you called me. I got up to Wednesday go to work. Morning. I got up to go to work Wednesday morning thinking, if Joshua feels fine today, then the likelihood that he has it is is very low. I think mm-hmm. we can move on. But you, um, But you said, hey, I feel bad. No, was this Tuesday or was this Monday? I'm actually confused. Uh, Wednesday morning um, is when I gave you the call and Wednesday. told you I thought yep, I had and it. Told me you were sick as a dog. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, I think it was. I think it was Tuesday that we called off going home. It was Tuesday yeah. that we said, actually, we're not going to go back home. And it was a good call. Uh, you know, beforehand. Because that that Wednesday next morning you were really sick and yeah it's so weird what did how you, you just wake think? up sick you know well to be honest I I was kind of 
getting sick all through Tuesday. And then once I got home from work around like five and six, I was when I really had a fever. I just didn't tell anybody until kind of the next morning. <laughs> was it because you already knew that I was, uh, was it because you already kind of knew that we called off the trip and everything? Yeah. And I didn't want to, I wanted to make sure that I was actually sick and not just feeling exhausted from the, the day or something like that. Mm-hmm. But what was your thought when I first went, like I called you that morning because I never call you at five in the morning. Yeah, I, uh, I, I was looking at my phone and I was like, feel like something, it's either going to be good news or bad news. <laughs> and it, most likely it's bad news because yeah. you don't just call me with good news that early. You knew I would yeah. be up probably um, because I get up early to go to work and you do, you do as well. But yeah. Mm. Um, it was good that you called me early because I uh, I needed to be in quarantine as soon as you got sick because I was around you a lot. And so I was yeah. very, very, actually, you know, Monday, you were probably exposed Friday. We were with you throughout the weekend, yeah. but we also did a podcast that Monday evening and we were doing it in hopes that this guy's pet test comes back negative. He's not actually you know, positive, you, we were all still feeling fine and you were feeling fine. We did a podcast Monday and, uh, and then Tuesday you started getting scratchy. You got the bad news and then Wednesday you were really sick. And so I was very heavily exposed to you doing a podcast for an hour and a half, two plus hours being around each other. And, um, and so I needed to just, I had to call in work or I sent an email into my my managers and just said, hey, I can't come in because it's a part of the rules. If you're exposed, you can't come in. Um, and uh, and so I did it, and they understood, and then they got me all set up to work from home for the rest of the, well, for that day, and then they had the rest of the week off, all of last week. Um, the week after yeah. Thanksgiving, I was working from home until me and my wife got back negative tests. We hadn't gotten sick or anything, but for a few days there, we were like, surely we're going to get sick for sure yeah. <laughs> because i was like there's no way i didn't catch it from joshua no way but we got negative yeah. tests and we never got sick so um so we just waited it out the rest of the week just to be safe but yeah but yeah it's crazy it, it was pretty uh it's been a pretty boring two weeks <laughs> after i kind of got over it i just like what do i do i mean i'm so bored being in this house being quarantined yeah. but um i think it's about ended now um today has been the day i mean yesterday i kind of got released from quarantine but i'm still waiting for to get a another test test. back to know for sure that i'm negative Mm -hmm. i took another test but But, you got through the sickness you got through the the symptoms yeah that's what that's what's the most dangerous part and you just kind of it wasn't dangerous it wasn't well not for you not for you but you're feeling like trash yeah okay um so what are you thinking all right so i thought it would be really good to get back to a little bit of storytelling on this podcast because uh we haven't told a story in a minute and then we can see where the conversation goes from there but um there was a couple things where i think where i think we should tell a story about related to filmmaking what was the a few biggest mistakes the greatest mistakes, the greatest, uh, the gr- the largest, the, greatest, <laughs> the largest mistakes, mistakes. Yeah, the largest mistakes that we have made when it comes to filmmaking. Um, I've done a few projects with people and personally, and that's actually going to be uh, for me both of them. Well, yeah. one one that was my project, one that was being a part of someone else's. And okay, um, do you want to go ahead and go first? Yeah, I'll I'll go ahead and go first. Um so a while back I had the ambition to pretty much I I was thinking I'm going to make my own feature film. I'm going to do it myself. Mm-hmm. I'm going to write a script and then I'm yeah. going to get behind a camera. I'm going to work with just a few actors. I'm going to keep it as simple as possible, but also make it as cool as possible. So when people watch it, they're going to be like, oh man, one guy did this whole thing, you know? Yeah. And I also didn't have any resources at the time that were really, uh, 
relying, I could really rely on. Which film was this? This was a, a film called Handled. Okay, that's one I thought. Yeah. And so I actually did. I, I, I did some research. I made sure that my script was feature film length. I wrote the whole thing out, all the dialogue. I casted quite a few people. I was making calls to people I knew, people I didn't know, and I started mm. filming scenes. And uh, I will say the first the first few scenes I did worked out. I was like, yeah, this is working. If I can just keep this up and get through the whole thing, then we'll be good. There was a few things that had loose ends. So I was um, saving. It was pretty much kind of like a street fighter. Um, almost like uh, Breaking Bad, not drug related, but kind of going downhill as character development and then kind of a salvation uh, or not. Salvation's a bad word. My word's all over the place tonight. <laughs> kind of a redemptive story at the at the yeah. end to help kind of have an uptick. And, but it was revolved around this street fighter. And, um, and pretty much I wrote the script. I got the pe main people cast. The guy that was playing the lead character, Noah Gordon, he was, um, really awesome. He has a natural talent to act. And I was starting to film scenes and I was going to do these fighting scenes closer to the end. Let those be like the last stuff I get to, right? And, and uh, I was going along, and then there was also like a lumberjack job element to the story. And um, I started noticing after a few days of production that uh, certain people weren't super reliable to show up on set. Not Noah, not a couple of these other people, but some other people that were involved, right? And there was quite a few characters which I'll circle back around and tell you mm. that was my biggest mistake, almost. There is so many characters. Yeah. So there's this one day we were filming early in the morning. I got permission from a guy at a lumber yard to film there as a location. And I had set everything up. I got confirmation from everybody. I get there really early in the morning. Noah Gordon, you know, the, the lead, shows up to to play the role to act and one extra that I had hired, well, I didn't hire, but that I had casted to be yeah. there, who was interested, he showed up. I hadn't met him before. And Did you ever talk to him after that? No, I, I don't even know his <laughs> name. And that that's the thing. Um, I, I'll, I'll explain this a little bit about my feelings about, about it once I finish, but we we start yeah. you know waiting times running out we're already getting into the day a little bit we're supposed to start you know 30 40 minutes before mm -hmm. and i already had a plan b in the back of my head i said you know what i i i'm i'm trying to stay out of this film as far as me acting right but if somebody doesn't show or is not reliable or i can't get someone cast i'll play a role yeah well, the person that was playing this one role ended up not showing up, which really bummed me out. We had to get filming because we were filming a good bit that day. Um, and actually, we were having to film a good bit because things were getting put off because of yeah. other days of getting behind or people not showing up. And... We started filming a scene and I was just going to act. So I would set up the camera, I'd roll, I'd get the focus as close as I possibly could guess with getting Noah to stand in like where I was, I would be standing. And we filmed a scene with just me and him. And, uh, and then we got to needing to film the next scene, which required more like two people at least yeah. that needed to be there. And no one was showing up. And I tried to call, and I didn't get any answer. And at nope. this point, I started, to, I started to feel like this is not happening because I'm at the breaking point almost. I had just moved to Columbia, South Carolina. Oh. And Wait, I was you were coming, in Columbia at that time? Yeah. I was, coming, I was driving up to Rock Hill area to film to get it finished. Okay. And so I had made a weekend trip to come up to that area to film Saturday. Which, all day Saturday. Columbia's like an hour. An, an hour, hour and, and a half, half drive. Yeah. 
and and it didn't happen. That 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 production day didn't happen. I knew because mm. things were getting put off that if we had put off any more, that it just wasn't going to work out. Mm. And I remember talking to Noah and saying, "Hey, I know we've already done like." five or six days of shooting, not full days, but, you know, periods of time on specific days to film scenes and get stuff filmed. And we had done so much already. And it was kind of at that point where I just said, man, I don't think this is going to work. I don't. Yeah, Things are already behind. I already took the place of playing a role myself, which I didn't want to do, but I did. And then other people aren't showing How long up. After that, what was the? Did you do Path to Crimson after that, or was it the hike? Um, the next thing after that was Path to Crimson, that of personal okay. projects. Well, yeah, of personal, because I remember you were DP on a bigger shoot that didn't turn out good, and I know you don't like talking about it, but oh, I'm that's that's my film. second thing. That's my second thing. Don't okay. If, yeah. if you want to talk about that, we can get into that as your second thing. Um, but yeah, I I remember this film. Um, I didn't help much with the first, I would say like first half of the handled film. And then I remember um, coming and helping for a couple shoots um, at, it was like, um, an older gentleman talking to Noah Gordon. Um, I was there that day. And then I was there the day that you kind of, we didn't, our, one of our actors or the two actors didn't show up and it kind of just fell apart. The you were there day. at the lumber yard that day? Yes, I was. Okay. Do you I not don't remember, remember that? that? No, I don't remember you being there probably because it was so upsetting to me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be honest, I. I don't want to give myself like props and say I did anything, but like I was there telling you like, hey, you need to just just k kill this project. It's you got to start from start over and do something different because this is not working. Yeah, I I'm curious to hear why why you thought I should kill it. Uh, but basically, I I had to tell Noah that we're not going to finish it. Yeah. I had to tell an uh, an an actor named Alyssa who had already filmed all of her scenes. Um, that we weren't going to finish. But I went ahead and edited the scenes we had filmed together, and they are here on the channel that you can mm. watch um, way down at the beginning, pretty much. And yeah. uh, and we didn't... We th There was more script that we needed to film than there was that we filmed. Yeah. And it was upsetting because I was like, man, this is like such a failure on my end what was it about what was it that i did that made it such a yeah. failure and i think what a couple things and we've talked about this before but a big mistake that i had to learn through writing a script through spending a lot yeah. of time and effort to see this not work was that you need people around you who can handle certain stuff and yeah that's and that what i was going to say I, I think it failed yeah, yeah. So it was because I it was just me. And so the reason yeah. that I got such a big head about I can do this on my own, I can make it work because I don't have much help at this point. Then if I do this, then I'm going to get help. I'm going to people are going to see this this cool project and they're going to want to be with me on the next one, you know. Yeah. And that didn't happen. Um, so I know for me when I thought I knew it was going to fail and I think this is why future projects have not failed. I'm not giving myself as much props, but like you said, you need other people. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't help with Path to Crimson after the, that. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't do much for Path to Crimson at all. Um, but like I said, I did help with this kind of the second half of mm -hmm. shooting. Um, and I remember like the night before we filmed at the lumber yard, which was the last day, we kind of went over the script and I kind of was like, hey, you don't have enough that you're going to be able to film. We we actually, I think we, I'm not 100% sure, but I think we were trying to cut out some of the script to make the, sh the film shorter. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't have to have as many actors. Yeah. But I remember, and 
um, not saying that that I'm the one who holds holds everything together, but kind of our dynamic at, when we create films is I take a lot of, not that I'm the producer, but I take the kind of a producer um, job in a way coming behind you. And I'm very, I'm very detailed oriented. I mean like, okay, so we're going to shoot. We need this, 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 and this. And, um, and usually I come behind and I tell you, be like, Hey, we need all these things. Do we have them? Um, would you agree with that? Yeah. But also you, you're, you're also a really good assistant director as well. Yeah. Um, so things well, that's that why I say kind of the producer, I, I kind of the producer, but producer. more, more of this, it's, it's if I need your help to direct something then I can ask you for your help. I don't yeah. have to, it's not even so much like what a producer actually does. I mean, you're you're definitely, you have an eye for attention to detail more than me, but you are able to um, be competent and observe and, and figure out what needs done in the moment yeah. better than other people I've worked with. And yeah. also it fills in holes that I didn't see. So I remember when we were filming Dying of the Leaves, you were, um, when I said, hey, can you go through and clear out branches that are going to be in the way? The camera's going to be there and the actors are going to be here. You went and found a saw. I didn't have to say, you didn't ask, hey, where's a saw at? I was like, there, you know, I might have mm. said like there might be a saw in my car, but you just went and found a saw somewhere you started cutting down trees that you like small ones and branch getting branches out of the way because we were filming in the thick woods that you oh, knew yeah. you knew would be a problem. This, That's just a, a silly day. example of yeah. what you. I didn't have to explain every detail. I didn't have to say I need this yeah. one gone. I need this place cleared out. You just were like, this is what the spots that he said are going to be. So I'm going to clear out these areas. I'm going to make sure that it's ready and I could get you know, working on the camera setup, working with the, um, I think Natalie was there that day and she, I was having her behind the camera. Yeah. And um, so I was able to work I mean, with her. That's kind of, kind of very similar to, I think we talked about this on a previous episode, so I just want to touch on it. But like this podcast, I mean, it's just mm -hmm. us for now. We don't have like a producer or like anybody doing sound or anything yeah. like that. It's just the two of us at the time being right now. Yeah. But a lot of times, I mean, for this podcast, we're like, we're going to film this day. And I'm like, okay, what do we need? So I always like come behind you and is like, okay, we need this, this, and this, mm -hmm. and we need this to shoot. And like, I kind of put everything together in a way, um, to know the details like that. But yeah, I would agree. Um, and that's kind of what I was saying. I was not a part of the first part of have handled so kind of once the last day came and i was looking at the script i'm like e there's no way you're gonna do this <laughs> so yeah i would say if, they, if you were to learn anything from my mistake uh yeah i would say don't don't try to do stuff on your own and don't try to do stuff alone because you need feedback and you need help especially yeah. with film with film productions unless you're doing something really small like we just did uh greater remembering that was really small we filmed it in a morning it was just us we got it done um yeah that's really I small will say, though if you're doing something have, simple and easy you know it's possible yeah. but and i will say we have worked on not huge projects but bigger projects like dying of leaves handled um yeah the hike so we know what it needs to be involved yeah now, those stretched us enough so that doing we can, greater remembering we know, was a piece of cake well, it's not even just a piece of cake. We know what what a film is going to um, require. What it's going to take to create, yeah, and require to create a film. I mean, we you wrote the script of Great Remembering for two people. I mean, you didn't. Yep. You made it so so it we was could do possible it. Possible to, yeah. yeah. I mean, it would have been a lot easier if we had a camera person and an audio person with us. I mean, we could have knocked it out in probably an hour or two if they just if we had those two people taking care of everything, we just kind of filmed it right quick. Mm -hmm. But we didn't, and we, we used a tripod, and we used... A uh, mic stand. A mic stand, yeah. yeah. So And that held up our equipment we that we it. needed. <laughs> yeah. 
And then the rest of the tricks were just editing. I mean, if there's like a zoom or something or effects for camera shake or something, that's all just in, in the editing. But I had to think through all that stuff ahead of time so I knew it would work. And I knew it would work because I've we've done projects like this before. And yeah. um, it helped with writing. Whereas before, I thought if I just wrote an awesome script and found people, they'd be like, yes, I want to do, I want to be in a film. And yes, they're going to all be naturally good actors. And, you know, it's going to be awesome and we'll show up and I can trust <laughs> that everything's just going to work out. And a lot of times it doesn't, especially when you're new and you have to go through a learning process. And if you bite off more than you can chew, sometimes it's good because it can help you understand where your limitations are for that season um, yeah. and see what resources you don't have. Cause sometimes getting started, you don't realize you you're lacking so many resources in the moment until you realize they're not there. And I, I will say film too, especially when you're getting started and you have like volunteers or being in Pretty front much of a everything. camera. Well, yes, but I'm kind of taking it a different direction. Being in front of a camera and putting your stuff online where not we don't have a huge audience but we have mm -hmm. an audience i would say um so putting someone in front of a camera especially if they're volunteering um there's a lot of people that see that as as like i don't know i don't know how what people see it as but they want to be in front of the camera but they're horrible at it or <laughs> they're not taking it as seriously because they are volunteers and, yeah horrible um, at it things like that <laughs> yeah yeah so I, are you saying I mean, like it helps you kind of learn what to look for? Or yeah, it, kind of. And you, you know, and you can rely on certain people and you know, I mean, how many times has someone come up to you when we were getting started, like for our first couple of films and where was like, I would like to be in your, one of your films. That would be awesome. And then many. they wouldn't, they would never re be reliable to come the day, shoot, be there and then maybe come a different day, multiple days and stuff like that. Yeah. Most of the time, if you're playing any role of importance in a film, yeah. you're going to need to be there at least two or three full days of filming. Most of yeah. the time, any role of importance. If you're the main or a second, um, second lead, then you're going to be there almost every day of production, which could be 10 to 12 to 15 to who knows how many, a month long of filming, you know? Yeah. And and so you got you're dedicating a lot of time and when you're working with volunteers it's not their gig. It's not you're not able to pay them money for this to be their job. So a lot of times you got to work around it. You got to work on weekends. You got to plan ahead and say, "Hey, what weeks are weekends and Saturdays over the next 2 or 3 months, over the next 5 months that you are definitely not available." You know what I mean? And so you have to you have to plan to help other to work with other people's schedules. And sometimes yeah. that means you're going to have to ask what what days of the week are you not available? Are you able to work on Fridays or Saturdays or Sundays? Um, and then you have to plan your schedule accordingly because you can't. The thing is, like with I got it. That's a thing. Yeah. Um, not throwing anybody under the bus, <laughs> but. Has there any been any projects that other people have asked you to be involved with that they're not as accommodating for you as someone who's volunteering for them or they just it's been a pain for you to be involved with the project even if you wanted to or if you didn't want to? <laughs> like if they asked me to volunteer and then um, they weren't yeah. working with my schedule? Yeah, or just... You're anything that's going wrong with someone asking you to be a part of their project? Um, I don't think so. Uh, the thing is, though, like not many people have asked me to be a part of their project. Oh, not okay. many people have. It definitely not casted me to be in anything. Um, they've asked. Sometimes they've asked for my advice or you know maybe help on the day or something. I got hired yeah. to do this one that was a big. It was a, a, it was a big mistake and also a very big learning <laughs> yeah, you, period. You want to go into that because you're bringing it up now. Yeah, yeah, I'll go, go into, into it. it. Another big mistake I I made was getting, uh, was choosing to work on this one Christian film, <laughs> that was yeah, um, which we briefly talked about it. Yeah, not very much though. Um, so it was very poorly done. Um, 
if he, I'm gonna if I, actually... before I before I lean into it, I want to say yeah. there's probably aspects to the camera I was using that I could have done better, uh, yeah. that I could have made better. But I also also we were shooting in a very log well, was log footage and black magic camera. And so it was very flat and the color correction was yeah. so terrible. The worst I've ever seen, ever. Which uh I going back, we watched it when I when I first moved down here, I think. Mm -hmm. Um because I have never seen it, this film. And it was a bigger film and it's actually free online right now out there. I'm not gonna say what it is or <laughs> promote the film, but um I went and watched it. We went and we watched it together, actually. And you're like, oh, this is terrible. And it wasn't a good film. I don't, th I wouldn't like not at all. saying it's a good film. Not at but all. But it wasn't as bad as you thought because you, I wasn't a part of it. Just watching the film, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> it was terrible. Um, <laughs> the, the director had probably done, I think, and this, I, there was warning signs for me, okay? Yeah. He asked me before we even started production, when we were still doing pre-planning meetings and stuff, he asked me to go ahead and edit. He would pay me to edit some footage he had done for a wedding of his friend. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know exactly what kind he was looking for, but I should have saw the warning signs that his idea of a wedding video was putting the camera on a tripod with really bad exposure and for one shot for the whole ceremony. And then he also, he got, I think, three shots of the cake. He got one shot of a table that had people's like gifts that they were giving of the wedding. Mm -hmm. And then the other shot was a wide, very long shot of people at the reception just a wide shot of the room that was a really yeah. long shot that just lasted for a long time and he wanted me to kind of put together this little wedding video and i should have saw the warning signs i was like first off this isn't a wedding video these are a few shots you got at a wedding you yeah. know i didn't know about this you know i don't think we ever discussed this you it's because i got paid it was before the film this was before yeah i did it and it was terrible and he did pay me but i told him this is all the footage i had <laughs> yeah um but he had filmed it and so then we get we finish pre-production um we did some table reads and i also noticed that for the film i had done before we started i started working on this film um i noticed that the volunteer actors that had no experience in my handled script that did show up were better at acting <laughs> than these people that were coming into that were Which, got the parts for this film. Yeah, that's a thing we can talk about very briefly. Um, Dustin, who, who we've had on this podcast, yeah, he that's where I met, met him. him on this film, and um, you met a lot of people part of. Path the Crimson, who played in Path the Crimson from this film, because mm -hmm. you filmed Path the Crimson right after this film. Correct me if I'm wrong. Right after or during? Uh, right after. Right after. Okay. Wait, are you saying we started filming Path the Crimson right after you yes, finished? With this right film? after we finished. Uh, well, pretty soon after we finished. And I'd like to think of it as Path to Crimson as this. Although Path to Crimson, yeah. if you watch it, there's going to be cringy. There's going to be cringy moments. Um, some of the acting's not super on point. Some of the writing and uh, story development's not super on point. But I will say, it was as close to a redemptive project that a lot of people that worked on Faith Song could get their hands on. So, I think um, myself, uh, Ethan, who I who was my DP assistant on mm -hmm. this um, on this Christian film I worked on. He was my straight up DP for Path to Crimson, and yeah. and then we uh, and then Julia. She was my producer, and I met her. As she was the continuity director, or continuity something at uh, on the other film, 
and then a few actors yeah. and I think I met her once. I never yeah. met Ethan. Yeah. And a few actors. And actually one of the really good actors in Path to Crimson was played a part in um in the Christian film, a small part, which blew mm-hmm. my mind how good he was in Path to Crimson. He was the the Reverend. His name is Perry Simpson. Yeah. Um, Wait, was in the film he was the Reverend too? No, in the film he was a doctor. In the in the Christian film, okay, he was a doctor. Okay, yeah, he played the Reverend in the yeah Pat the Crimson. Yeah, in the, in Pat the Crimson he played the Reverend. He's a great actor, very good. Um, <laughs> yeah, I remember we did an interview with Zach and I think I think I did a podcast interview with Zach and Justin on the uh, the old podcast that they used to make called yeah. the Status Effect Podcast. And they had me on, and I was talking Which didn't about it. Zach, did did Zach write the script, or did he Zach kind of co-write took the or was script. he involved? He Zach took the script and edited it for me. Okay, so he made notes. He looked it over, let me know a few things that could change, um, things that he thought would be good adding. And he he was in school, I think, at the time for creative writing, and yeah. um, so I was getting his help on the script side of things for Path to Crimson. And then they really liked, I mean, Perry Simpson's acting as the Reverend and Pat the Crimson really shone through. But we're talking about that. We're talking about things that, you know, that there was mistakes made on that. But bigger mistake was, um, well, the thing is that, that it's a weird, I call it a mistake, but I think it might be one of the most difficult situations I've found myself in at this point. I remember there was one day that, uh, you know, Dustin, who we had on the podcast, he's an amazing filmmaker. He's an amazing creative guy. Uh, he did my wedding highlight video. I've worked with him yeah. on Star Wars fan videos, that Christian film. He's worked with me on other projects. I bounce things off him all the time. Um, he's an amazing creative guy, and he's done awesome films, and I'm really excited to see the one he's coming out with soon called A Monster in the House. Um. But he didn't get a chance to help me out with Path to Crimson um, because he was busy, and I think he was getting married around that time. But Mm -hmm. I'm really happy I was able to work on that film because it allowed me to work with Dustin. However, he started rubbing... um, He started getting in little verbal scuffles with the director named Frank. (laughs) And, And then that slowly turned to like us talking and being like, hey... We we kind of know what we're talking about, and we're starting to see this guy Frank doesn't know what he's talking about at all, you know? Yeah. Um, and we're a lot younger than him, and he's been talking himself up, saying he's done a lot of projects, and he just clearly hasn't. And that's why I said I sort of should have saw red flags at the beginning. And and then uh, and then I started getting into a few scuffles myself with Frank. Um, about simple stuff like the 180 degree rule on set and he would scold yeah. me in front of everybody and tell me to keep my mouth shut and uh, and that there was a weekend where <laughs> she just uh, you should have just like pulled up um, like Harvey Dent just pulled up on your phone and being like shut up <laughs> <laughs> shut up I think um, I think there was one weekend where he had called Dustin before me and basically told him, I don't want you talking back to me at all during the production of this film. It's my film. I've put all this money on the line and I've taken yeah. out a second mortgage to get this thing funded and it's going to be huge. We got Marcus Lattimore in the film. <laughs> like it was, it was a big mess. And then he called me right after that same day, that same afternoon and told me the same thing. And he said, if you can't keep your mouth shut, then I don't want you on the film and you don't have to be here if you don't want to. And I said, I signed a contract. I'm going to finish my contract. There's only a few weekends of filming left, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've already been there through the whole thing. And and I was going to get that little bit of money he was paying me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so uh, we stuck it out and we finished it. Um, But it was just crazy to me how he took us saying, hey, I think this is a better creative decision. Or even us being subtle and saying, hey, I think it's time to for us to like think through what, we, what we're doing here in this scene. Yeah. And, and let's, let's discuss it real quick because we're doing a lot of wrong things. 
It's not going to cut together well. It's not going to edit together well. It's not going to look good on screen. We're breaking rules unnecessarily, and it's not going to look right. Yeah. And it was gen. It w- at the beginning, it was genuine from creativity. It moved to slowly to bitterness on our end, I'm sure. And then we started becoming a little less, you know, subtle. But he took it as offensive the whole time. So he he got his butt hurt constantly, and that's that's a personal <laughs> issue that he has to deal with on well, a human level. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's always uh, there's always ways when you're young or younger and you have some knowledge, uh-huh. um, and an older generation they kind of get butt hurt because yeah, you're trying they, to help them with yeah, it, and you exactly. you're trying to do it in a humbling way, but they don't take it in that way, and they just they come into the very situation proud. very proud, believing yeah. they ha- they know they know their stuff. And then if yeah. a, a someone who's younger significantly um, comes in and, and is showing showing a higher level of skill, they can't take that as, oh, that's great, they're working on my project so we can make it better together. They have this thought of, oh, now I have to order him or her around because they don't know as much as me or I can't, I can't give the illusion that they know. And when we're suggesting, hey, we're breaking a rule here, and he doesn't yeah. understand what we're talking about and in front of people because yeah. he doesn't know any rules, like simple stuff, then all of a sudden he gets defensive because if we're calling him out, unintentionally calling him out, assuming he knows some stuff, then he uh, he's going to he's gonna attack, you know, because he yeah. doesn't want to look like he doesn't know what he's doing because he has a sense um, of pride that he doesn't want to, he doesn't want so to. So I haven't leave yeah i haven't gotten to any of my stories um but i have one i'll just share this and then we can finish up the podcast is that okay yeah you only have one um well i had a couple but we're i mean we're hitting over an hour at this point um we're we're at 54 minutes we're at 54 minutes um this is not in film per se but this is in live tv broadcast okay um so for a while right after i graduated from um, the school I went to, I worked at a TV station in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I mean, live TV is always really hectic. Mm-hmm. Um, I know. Um, so when you're working in live TV, there's always things that, that you have to kind of improvise and there's like backup plans for if something goes wrong and they're always trying to fix things. I mean, that's the job of the director, the producer of every the editors that are there, the everybody's there to kind of the at least the crew are mm-hmm. there to kind of fix mistakes if anything happens on air. Yes. Um and I know one time specifically, and this happened probably a little a couple times, but one story that it wasn't my fault, but it was my fault in a way. So <laughs> okay. Um, there was a couple of different editors um, that were there for the morning show, which I did. There was four of us. Um, and, well, actually, no, there was three of us at the time, at mm-hmm. this time. And we would take turns running the teleprompter on the show. Um, for one hour, one editor would go back there and run the prompter. Then the next hour, the the other editor would go back and do the, run yeah, the prompter. Yeah. Well, I remember one day there was a really break, there was breaking news right away. And as an editor, they kind of had like a lineup of the show um, while it was going like live production. And you could see they had like a red bar across the the lineup of the show. And you could see where they were for, uh, doing the live show because it would kind of go down the lineup of the, the stories of the show. Mm-hmm. And all the time they would give us footage and be like edit this together and get it in the lineup right here when they're right here in the lineup and it's it's tv's going live so if you don't get it in the lineup by the time it airs then just gonna be black it's gonna be black or they're gonna have to skip over that story yeah which messes up everything because then they have to the prompter in the back has that story in it you have to skip past that story with the prompter they have to just skip over and fill that time because tv is very time oriented Mm -hmm. and Um, they're live like everything's yeah everything's scheduled on time so i was back in the booth running the prompter and 
and the ed- the other editor came back and kind of replaced me. So I went back and I was going to my editing booth that I would set at every day. And I I as soon as I sat down, I remember getting an email from the producer saying, "Hey, edit this footage together and put it in the lineup. It needs to air pretty quick." Mm-hmm. And so I was like, "Okay, I look for that I'm looking for that footage." <laughs> and I couldn't find the right footage that yep. they needed for the show. Come to find out what happened was they sent a mass email to all the editors that was like, edit this footage together and put it in the lineup before I, I left the booth when I was running the prompter. Mm-hmm. And so the other editor switched out with me and I went back to my editing booth and I was the only editor there. So <laughs> I was supposed to edit this footage. But yep. they had sent out an email to everybody that I didn't look at saying, <laughs> um, edit this footage together hey, because I was this. back in the booth at the time. <laughs> um, so when I got back to my editing booth, I didn't realize what I was supposed to edit together. So you're just sitting and there. <laughs> I'm just sitting there like, what am I supposed to edit together? Dum, da, dum, da, I, dum. See, I see the email edit this footage together, but I don't have the footage to edit together. Yeah. And... Um, so it was kind of just a mix up with us switching prompters and what happened? switching between jobs. I ended up not getting it in the lineup. And they skipped <laughs> over guess it. Guess what? They skipped over it, but guess what? You got at the end out. of the show at the end of the show, we would always have a like a meeting with the producer director and the anchors uh and meteorologists and things like that. And guess what came up? They're like, "Hey, Josh, we sent you that email." You didn't get it in the lineup. Mm-hmm. Your fault. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it was it was a mess up. <laughs> That's all I can it was, say. It was not much communication that, that screwed everybody, but also yes. it was you didn't do the work. I mean, yeah, you know, usually, at least in a good working environment that people look out for each other kind of, you would try to send a follow-up email and be like, hey, this email contains information. Did you see this? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Or whoever's editing it, did you see this? Um, especially when you're closer to time. But, uh, you know, I guess, did uh, how did that make you feel when you messed up like that? Like, was it <laughs> was it embarrassing? Were you angry? It was Were you embarrassing for your job? at first, yes. Scary? Um, I know when I first started working in TV, and this was a, a decent-sized station, so when I would mess up like, for things like that i was like oh no i messed up after a while you kind of learn you once you learn your job and are start getting a little bit good at it Mm -hmm. um you understand this is what a human can do and they're expecting a little bit more of me than i can actually do yes i need to push myself to do my best but if i can't get it in there it's because i'm a human and i can't always do what they want right now yeah the system's Um, not always flawless yes um most of the time people will require a little bit more of you than you can actually do now there's an extent where you can be lazy and not be doing what they need when it's very basic but there's also people will push you if you do good anyway yeah what what do you think the ratio is to people who genuinely mess up or people who are just lazy and are constantly messing up? Like, do you think there's a good distinction? Because everyone messes know. up, but a lot of people seem to mess up more. And do you think that's just because people are lazy? You know, if you find yourself constantly messing up. I don't know. I think, um, I don't want to say today's culture kind of helps people to be lazy. But well, go ahead and it say it. If that's what you think. <laughs> Um, something I did learn when I was in college though, that my professor told me one time was if somebody tells you something to do something, you need to listen to what they're doing and don't ask them again, because that's going to be annoying to them. You need to pay attention to what they're saying and be able to accomplish that thing without asking them over and over again, what I need to do. Um, and that's something that I've tried to do, especially with <laughs> things that I've had to edit or just taking advice from people. If they give me a job, just kind of go and know what I need to do and get it accomplished. And then they can come back and be like, okay, it's already finished. I don't need to follow up with this person. But mm-hmm. um, that makes sense. So, yeah. 
that's my story. Do you that's, wanna? That's that's good. I think um, going on what you were just saying though, I think, I think that our culture is breeding people to yeah. believe their believe their worth. Now, if you're human, you have human value, same as every other human. But if you think that if you're of the opinion that you like you are valued if you have the opinion that you are contributing well to society to your family to your friends to your own personal freedom and personal uh, responsibility for yourself so others don't have to take care of you yeah you there has to be a metric by which you gauge that and if you are constantly making mistakes um it's it I think there's I don't think people are always just naturally clumsy. I think it there might be a pattern in people's lives that cause them to make mistakes. Um and then if you kind of if you can figure out how to remedy that, then you will find yourself making less mistakes, you'll find yourself becoming more successful and you're always going to make mistakes, but they're going to be more limited. And then you'll also start to see that you're not making mistakes based on what people ask you to do or little things here and there. You actually start to make mistakes out of that that are actually more like failures because failures are when you start to take big risks. And when you're taking bigger risks, like um, for example, when I was trying to make a film on my own, that was a failure. It wasn't yeah. a mistake. It was a failure because I was reaching out and trying something new. I learned so much from that, right? Yeah. When I was working on that other film, um, it was a, it was ultimately a failure because the project, although it got complete, the project didn't make its money back to the extent that it wanted to or the extent that it was projecting to investors. It wasn't well made. It wasn't, you know, visually pleasing or cinematic in any way in my in my opinion, even though I was the DP. I would consider that a failure, but I learned so much from it. Do you think there's something to making a mistake or and a failure that those can be different that those can be uh distinguished from each other and do you think you can learn yeah. from mistakes or is it just primarily learn from failures like what do you think about that so i heard this someone talking about it on a podcast mm -hmm. where they said as like babies they when they're learning to walk they they start to walk and then they fall and then they get back up and try again um, and then we've, we've kind of put the stigmatism and once we get older, like in our twenties or older that we're not supposed to, f we're not supposed to fail anymore, um, or mess up or, um, anything like that. We're supposed to be mm -hmm. perfect and get it and learn it in the first try. Yeah. I don't think that's how as humans we learn. I think how we learn is we do something we fail at it then we do it again and we most likely fail at it again but then we do it again and then we actually like succeed and get it accomplished or learn what we're trying to get accomplished mm -hmm. um yes so it's so different i mean there as there's people in today's culture that they like perfectionists that kind of put this thing where you have to be so perfect but then there's also, so they do their best. But then, yes, there is also lazy people. So, I don't know. I mean, I think it's your, your okay, I'm going to use the word personality and say how you are. Are you a lazy person or are you um, trying to, like, fail at something so you can learn from your mistakes? I mean, it really just depends. Mm -hmm. I think... um. I think uh, there's an aspect of some things that are pretty, I think most of the time, th most mistakes and failures you can learn from. I think if you're having a failure, then it's like I was saying earlier, you're going after something bigger. You're going after maybe a dream, maybe a, a big goal of your own. And yeah. you're if you when you fail, you're going to learn more. And I think you hold those a little closer to your, uh, a little closer to your heart because it was like you failed at something you tried. Whereas a mistake was you just made a mistake and I won't do that again.
but it was just a mistake, you know? Yeah. I think failure, yeah. they're kind of in the same family and they might be very close to the same thing. But ultimately, I think failures, failures reserved for those times when you're trying something bold, you're trying something, you know, you, like you have ambition and you made a mistake in the pursuit of that ambition, you know? Yeah. And it became a failure. And you learn things more through that failure than you would just a common mistake. You know, yeah. it's like the difference between the common cold and COVID. You learn so much more <laughs> when you get COVID than you do with the common cold, you know? That is true. Or it affects um, you more. <laughs> do you kind of want to end the episode now? Are we we going to end it? Yeah. Are I mean, is there... End it? I, I, we, we can go ahead and end it. We're not super... I mean, we're... I think we're about an I, hour. I mean, I, I'm coming minutes. up with ideas, and I have an idea for next week's episode that um, is going to be a Christmas episode. I'm going to okay. talk to you about it. And we're going to do it, hopefully. Um, okay. <laughs> so, I guess um, this is the end of the episode. And um, go follow us on Spotify. We have Spotify. We have the Midnight Special on Spotify. Subscribe to this channel. Um, like us on Instagram, Facebook, wherever we have content. And yeah, yeah. If, you, if you've if you made it to this far, we're super thankful for you. Um, and you're watching yeah. this on YouTube. If you would, please, um, we don't normally ask this, but I want to start. Uh, we get ranked better in suggested videos that YouTube will promote if you like our videos, if you leave a comment, because the, the algorithm yeah. sees interaction. They see a liking of the video, and you get suggested more. And so you guys can play a direct part by simply liking and commenting on these videos. Um, mm -hmm. and helps expand our growth a little bit and it's a super easy yep. thing to do so we ask you to like and comment and of course if you're not already subscribe and hit the bell so you know when we come out with new videos uh, every single week yep so we're here to make geeks out of you and have a good week subscribe to Olin Rogers yep. see you later <laughs>